everyone, and welcome to this special episode of the Geek Bites brought to you by the Geek Bites. <gasps> hey! 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 <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell we got a time constraint today? Hello. All right. So we're <laughs> into, as you read from the title, and I hope you read the title, maybe you just love everything Geek Buddies, you click play. But we are talking today about this big Forbes article that dropped just a few days ago detailing whether Disney fudged the numbers on how profitable Star Wars has been for the Mouse House. Uh, Carolyn Reed uh, did an incredible breakdown of this really incisive exploration of this stuff here on Forbes. And there have been a number of articles that have come out since breaking down what Carolyn Reed broke down in her article about uh, Star Wars, about the profitability of Star Wars, mentioning how much they purchased for, how much they paid for Star Wars, mentioning how the return of investment report, the six, seven page report that Bob Iger used to defend himself and essentially win the recent battle for board seats against Nelson Peltz, Ike Pormulter and others was used and fabricated and fudged a little bit. And and they even based future numbers as a reason for more investment and as a reason for profitability. So a lot across the board on this one. We're going to talk about it, break it down, and have some fun with the three of us. Uh, before we start, though, for those who might be new, let's introduce ourselves. I'm the outlaw John Roker, writer, producer, and host here on uh, The Geek Buddies. I am Michael Vogel, writer, producer of animated TV shows and movies and Disney show. <laughs> Just gonna get that out of the way right now, right. so that uh, right. so that we don't have to dive into it later. Let's just do it. And, <laughs> and this is Shannon McClung. I'm an animation writer and a television actor, and I don't do number good, so I don't know how much help I'm going to be. <laughs> <laughs> but Carolyn Reed sure can type a lot of words. Yeah, yeah, clearly. Uh, and this is the second she wrote two articles about this. One on April 4th that was breaking down the initial six, seven page document that was put out there. And this one specifically addressing the section on Star Wars. So, Michael, you read this thing. You went through it. You've been in the halls of power. You've been in those rooms talking about profitability, talking about what's going to work, what's not going to work. When you're looking through this article, what is your impression of this article? And what is your impression of the backlash or the response to this article that we've seen online as well? Well, OK, so giving some context to my yeah, feelings please. about this article, like having been an executive at places like Hasbro, mm -hmm. where you are constantly dealing with how do you grow IP over five to 10 to 20 years? Yeah. Uh, when you're talking about My Little Pony, you're talking about Hasbro, you're talking about uh, Transformers, you're talking about um, Lucasfilm, you're talking about Marvel. For a brand and an IP to grow in a way that makes it massively successful, that is a multi-year plan. Mm. When you are talking to investors, you're talking about quarterly earnings. And so one of the things that was always frustrating at Hasbro was when you're making plans for, hey, we've got Transformers Prime coming out at the end of this year. What are we going to do for season two? What are we going to do for season three? How are we going to grow this into more series? Maybe we do a spinoff series about the Decepticons. Maybe we introduce Beast. You have all of these really great ideas. And then the Hasbro ha Hasbro has a big meeting with their board about their quarterly reports. And everybody looks at the profits of Transformers in that quarter and yeah. says, nope, don't do any of that. It's not making money. Wow. And you go, okay, cool. So this entire concept in general is one of those things like those quarterly earnings, those investor reports, that talking to the board versus how are we going to creatively use storytelling and character to grow things over multiple years? Those things never quite match. And it's probably pretty clear which side I fall on. <laughs> um, and so with this, keep in mind the big thing here is uh, Richard Peltz and Ike Permelter. Per yeah. I can never say his last name. Ike the Permelter, Devil. Yeah. Um, those two guys, like their whole thing coming in is like, Disney's not running Disney well. Yeah. We should split the company up into different factions. We should do different things. We should like have this group over here, have this group over here. And Disney says that would be really bad because it is the synergy that we have between the different departments, between feature, between Disney Plus, between theme parks, between consumer products that actually makes the Disney brand the Disney brand. Yeah. So again, not hard to tell where I fall on this whole, uh, where I think, where I think the, the right side of that is. And so in reading these articles, like did Disney fudge their numbers? Did Disney do some creative reporting? Absolutely. Hmm. Does every company kind of do that when they talk to their investors? Yeah, they do. Like hmm. an investor's report is not a, here are the facts, plain and simple, black and white. Let us all discuss them. 
an investor's report is supposed to be like, rah, rah, this is what we're doing well. And I think where I had trouble with this Forbes article and the previous Forbes articles, because I kind of went back on a deep yeah. dive and read all the articles she wrote, yeah. is that, A, I feel like they're a little bit slanted. Um, I think mm. her opinion on Disney is pretty clear. But B, ultimately, even though Disney's numbers are a little bit, let's say, creative in the way that they reported them, um, I think that the Disney's purchase of Star Wars is smart. And I think that even though I don't particularly love the new trilogy as much as I love other parts of Star Wars, and I understand why that return on investment didn't work, hmm. I think the bigger purchase of Star Wars, when you consider The Mandalorian, when you consider Grogu as a character, when you consider Batu at uh, Disneyland and Disney World, like when you consider all the pieces of it, I think what they're reporting in the investment report states is accurate that over time yes. star wars is a great purchase and what bob Iger did with star wars and marvel and pixar and fox was smart and over time is going to be very successful for the company and so i think the entire article of like let's let's pinprick this whole thing and be like well the actual earnings of this specific thing are stated in this way i'm like sure but that's not the point the yeah. point is was this a good idea or not is Disney owning Star Wars a good idea? And from a 30,000 foot view, which as an investor is how you want to look at things, that's the answer. Yeah. So that's kind of how I feel about it. Okay. Yeah. Um, Shannon, she leads the article off with a very explosive statement by saying box office profits generated by Disney Star Wars movies have fallen 2.8 billion short of covering the media giant's purchase of the of the of Lucas film here, according to analysis of recently filed financial statements she talks about the return of investment then she talks about how there's there's stuff in the fine print and in the fine print it's revealed that the purchase price of lucasfilm isn't even included in the return of investment calculation she goes on further to talk about how profit is broken down shared between the theaters and that's how she came to this analysis but she also says well, i'm not factoring in the parks i'm not factoring the comic books i'm not factoring in the books i'm not factoring in all this other stuff so it's kind of tough to arrive to an overall conclusion, whether it's been profitable or not for Disney using their numbers or your numbers. If you don't have all the numbers accurately right in front of you and factually right in front of you, what did you think of this extensive article here? What, what, what did you take away from it here? One, I thought it was unnecessarily extensive. I thought it was unnecessarily <laughs> wordy. I think there was a way. I think wow. I think I think a good editor could have come in and been like, Caroline, let's pump the brakes a little bit. We've only got, <laughs> we've only got so much bandwidth that we can print stuff on. Um, but also, all the stuff that you add, she also says some things that are demonstrably incorrect. Okay. In the third paragraph, Whoa. it says all the stars align when The Force Awakens, the first film in the new series, was released in 2015. According to industry analyst Box Office Mojo, it grossed a staggering 2.1 billion, causing Disney to commission two spin-off movies as well as the two sequels. So one, not true. Um, Rogue One was already filming, so right. they had a plan. Right. So when you start your when you start your manifesto off with things that are inaccurate, yeah. already I'm like, I don't trust I don't trust what you're saying mm. because this is, I think as any star Wars fan, as any most movie person knows, this wasn't, that's not correct. Yeah. When they announced what they were going to do, they announced those spinoffs right off the bat. Um, so the fact that she got that wrong, which is a yeah. fairly easy thing to, to research automatically tells me, I'm like, you don't know what you're talking about. And, and the fact that she's not adding in, because when you buy, a, a monolith like Lucasfilm, you're not just buying the ability to make movies. You're buying right. the ability to make TV shows. You're you, you're you, you're not factoring how much how much Disney the parks got a bump from mm -hmm. Star Wars. You're not factoring in merchandise. Right. These are all gigantic numbers that she is. I mean, and she's admitting it. Like, hey, you yeah. know, this isn't factoring in this. But it's like, but you kind of have to factor it in because yeah. it's all under the same umbrella. Yeah, Mike. Well, I think that yeah. In addition to that, she does she does devote multiple paragraphs to talking about them shooting in the UK yes. and the tax credits they got as if this was some like earth shattering revelation when every studio shoots somewhere to get tax. A, they shot where the original Star Wars movies were shot. So creatively yeah. you're like, yeah, that makes sense. But B like, there's a reason that Superman and Lois is shooting in Vancouver right now. There's a reason that mm. Marvel movies shoot in Atlanta. Like you go to the places with tax credits. So like, there's a lot of stuff in here to Shannon's point where you're like, we're, we're diving into all of these things and you're like, cool. But like, yeah. again, the 30,000 foot view and what the investors report is set out to do is, Hey, 
is Disney doing the right thing by buying these big brands or did they make a big mistake? Yeah. And I think that what this article is sort of proposing is that because there wasn't this return on investment of Force Awakens, Last Jedi, and Rise of Skywalker, somehow this shows that Disney isn't really uh, doing all the things they should do for their shareholders. Yeah, you, I mean that, you, that like like if you were just gonna say like taking all of the specifics of the numbers and you know like it's like a do we think that companies should uh, not be fuzzy with their numbers? Should there be a oh, across sure. the board? This is how we report numbers. Right. Sure, I think we can all agree that that's probably true. Right. But every company does what Disney's doing when they're reporting to their shareholders. Everyone's going to put the rosiest view on. So if you want to say, hey, companies shouldn't do that, sure, we can all agree. But don't hold Disney up to a standard you're not going to hold everyone else up to. But beyond that, the bigger question here is, yeah. and she says this in one of her earlier articles, like what Bob Iger is going to be remembered for more than anything else is he bought Pixar, he bought Marvel, he bought Star Wars, he bought Fox. Mm -hmm. That was not cheap. That is a ton of money. Yep. And what this article is really diving into is, did you make your money back for your investors? You spent right. all this money. Did you make your money back? And she doesn't really touch Pixar. She doesn't really touch Marvel because it's pretty clear they made their money on that. Yes, um, but the yeah, yeah. yeah, but the Star Wars thing, we're really diving in on and be like, okay, well, let's look at how they fudged these numbers to make it look like Star Wars was a good purchase. But right. the bigger question stepping back from that is, was Star Wars a good purchase for Disney? Yeah. And that's the, and, and I think that she gets a little lost in the weeds on it when I think, and, and look, we talk about this every week. We could dive in deep on what Disney and Lucasfilm are doing wrong with Star Wars right now. That's sure. a creative conversation. And I right. think we've all, you know, there are, they've, they've been making mistakes with Marvel. They've been making mistakes with Star Wars. There's a ton of things they could do better, but Disney owning Star Wars as an IP, uh, I think when you look at the parks, when you look at everything else, um, Long term, I don't hmm. see how you could argue that this is a bad decision. Yeah, as you said earlier, um, I want to touch base and give a little a background on what you're talking about with uh, Disney and shooting in the UK. You're right. She uses this interesting sentence and, and words here. Disney devised an ingenious way to make money back on the movie. Instead of shooting it in the US, it shows Pinewood Studios in the UK where the original trilogy, as you said, Michael has been made. They, this enabled it to benefit from the UK government's audiovisual expenditure credit, which gave the studios a cash reimbursement of up to 25.5% of the money. So, and, and they spent in the UK provided it represents at least 10% of the film's costs and goes on to say that yeah. this kept going. They raised the reimbursement ceiling recently. The UK did it to 25% to fend off other countries who were trying to do the same thing. So in essence, they made a lot of money by making a smart move as a company well, to go not only to shoot in a place that has Star Wars mythology already connected to it, but also a place that would save them money. So I don't understand how that's a bad thing. And I don't understand how you can say that's a negative thing about how they were trying to make profit. That's well, how you make profit. You and that, and but this is where this article really sort of started to irk me. It's like yeah. Disney made an ingenious choice. <laughs> yeah. Like, like as if this was some earth uh, guys, yeah. Disney, we're going to really save a buck. You're like, literally every studio does this. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. they're like half of Hasbro shows. When I worked at Hasbro were being animated in Canada. Mm -hmm. You know why tax credits? Yeah. Like yeah. that's, that is a thing that everybody does when you are looking at where you're going to shoot something, where you're going to produce something, where you're going to animate something like France has animation tax credits. Atlanta has tons of tax credits. Like the UK, like all these places have tax credits. And so this is like the, this is like, look at what they did to try and save this money. And they saved this amount of money. You're like, yeah, cool. Good business, but also not ingenious. And even to our, pushing back on you a little bit, not even particularly smart. Oh, it's okay. just the way that business is done. Like it's okay. pretty clear cut. So that's the thing is like, there were so many things in here that I was like, I feel like you're a little <laughs> slanted. I don't know. Like it just, it yeah. really struck me as surprising. Like she goes, not in this article particularly, but by mm. way of my point, she goes on this whole thing in one of the earlier articles that, uh, that is linked to in this Forbes article yeah. about how Disney says that frozen returned like a 9.9 .9 yeah, times on 9 investment. Times, yep. Um, and she was like, and it's really hard to figure out how they calculated that since frozen wasn't an IP that they purchased. You're like, no, but they, they, they calculated it the way you would calculate it. Like yeah. we spent this much on frozen one and frozen two. Yeah. 
and we have made this much money on Frozen 1 and Frozen 2. And so it's it's sort of like, she's like, how did they figure this out? Like, mo movie studios always figure out how much money they made on a movie. Like, mm. Barbie, we spent this much money on the movie and this much money on marketing. The box office was this. Mattel made this much. Like, it's a pretty easy thing. But she kind of argues, like, well, if they didn't purchase the IP, how could you possibly have figured this out? So right. there's a lot of, like, what is your point? Like, what are you trying to get at here? Aside from overall saying Disney should have reported it in this way. Yeah. Like that's like at the bottom line of, of some very, very long and wordy articles. There is a Disney should have reported to their investors differently, which, okay. Argue that one way or the other and B Disney is right or wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think her opinion on that is pretty clear. I also think my opinion on that is pretty clear. So <laughs> we would probably have really a really hefty conversation if we were arguing about this in a bar, but <laughs> I'd love to have a guest on the show. That could be a fun conversation. Let's look at this. This is the graph that's put in here, Shannon. When you look at uh, what they're using here, like the Disney's box office share, Disney's net spending, Disney's net profit loss. That's what clearly Force Awakens here, looking at the money that they spent and profit 559 here. Profit on Rogue One, 281. Profit on Last Jedi, 346. No pro loss of profit on Solo. Loss of profit on Rise of Skywalker. And so you see this is what the, essentially she seems to be using as the basis for the um, uh, takeaways that she's getting from all of this and looking at the report and looking at all the analysis and the, and, and the um, overall results of profitability of Disney. But if you're just looking at the movies, aren't you kind of short circuiting what you're actually looking at overall as a brand and the possibility of what it can make here shannon well i mean this this is another in my opinion flaw in in the article is yeah. if disney were only in the movie making business that that graph would be incredibly accurate yeah. but you are not factoring in everything else that disney does that star wars is related to right um and, and even and again i i got so so focused on this third paragraph i did read the rest of it uh but another thing that she says that really drove me crazy was as the series continued there was a disturbance in the force due to an over-reliance on computer generated effects and a lack of the gritty quirky characters who made the ori original movie smash hits yeah so coming out of that sequel trilogy there were there was a lot of criticism and in my opinion a lot of valid criticism no one no one commented on the effects yeah. Like if you were to say that about the prequels, I think I think there's there is a valid argument there. I mean, what J.J. Abrams and his his team did yeah. it was go. They went back to using a lot of those practical effects. And in doing so, they created a very rich world, a very tangible, rich world. And look, in terms of the gritty, quirky characters, uh, you know, again, coming out of the prequels. Yeah. A lot of folks weren't uh, at the time. A lot of folks were not big there were a lot of folks that weren't big fans um mm -hmm. in the time that has passed because of the clone wars because of the kids that watched the prequels and loved them as they grew up those characters gained value yeah. and now i mean hayden christensen who was you know notoriously uh, uh uh lambasted for some of his performance in the prequels now the fans cannot get enough of him and they right. want more and when you think about the characters that they have introduced Again, no one came out saying these performances were bad. Right. Um, you know, the, the the stories were just a little, the stories were a little messy. And I think going forward, those characters, Finn, Ray, Poe, those characters are going to gain in value ju just like the way Anakin and young Obi-Wan. Yeah. And it's I so mean, you think about, if you really think about, you know, with Star Wars night coming up and Season of the Force coming up and Disneyland celebrate, I'll give you a better, I'll give you an example of something that worked for Disney that I think supports the Disney argument, Nightmare Before oh. Christmas. Oh, uh, yeah. I love Nightmare Before Christmas. I loved it when it came out in theaters. Not everybody did. That movie didn't do great. Nightmare Before Christmas was not a box office smash. Yeah. It did fine. Like, I think it made its money back, but it was a close thing. Like, it was not a huge movie. Right. It was loved by a very specific group of people, but it wasn't like, it wasn't a Frozen it wasn't Wednesday on Netflix. Like right. it was decent. And it had like a little bit of merchandise here and there. Hot Topic had some Jack Skellington t-shirts. Like it did okay. Right. Cut to 20, 25 years later, and Disney does a revamp of Haunted Mansion where they put Nightmare Before Christmas in there 
every October to January, Haunted Mansion becomes Nightmare Before Christmas. They sell so much merchandise. It becomes the hottest ticket. You can't get in there. The line is like two hours long. Like Nightmare Before Christmas has become, from a consumer product standpoint, very successful for Disney now. Yeah. Like years and years later, because they have that ecosystem, they have the parks, they have Disney Plus, they have all these things. So that is how Disney, on the on their side of the argument, is arguing. Yeah. So even the other thing she says is when they're talking about the the return on investment of Star Wars, they're also yeah. like they're looking ahead towards the movies that they're they're going to be making, the TV shows they're going to be making. And they're like, nope, you can't do that. Like that's not that's not fair reporting. But I think in the way that you have to look at IP and the way you have to look at a synergistic ecosystem mm -hmm. for a corporation like Disney that is creatively how you should be looking at things yeah um like another example would be princess and the frog like when princess and the frog came out in theaters again it did fine but it was the last 2d animated movie that disney ever made yeah uh you know it didn't it didn't knock the socks off of everybody and i think people thought it was a decent to moderate success but it apps it was no frozen it was no tangled it was no moana but now Splash Mountain in both Disney World and Disneyland are becoming Tiana's Bayou Adventure and people really love Tiana. So Disney has this way of like taking character, taking story, taking IP. We're gonna, we, we've got Queen Amidala hmm. and Darth Maul and Anakin Skywalker showing up at Seasons of the Force. And to Shannon's point, when those prequels came out for a older, for the older Star Wars fan, those characters weren't necessarily beloved. Yeah. To the younger Star Wars fans who that was their introduction to Star Wars, they grew up with those characters and love them. And yeah. there's a whole generation of kids right now that despite our opinions on Force Awakens, Last Jedi or Rise of Skywalker are growing up with those movies, growing up with Mandalorian on TV, growing up with even Book of Boba Fett on TV as much yeah. as we all don't yeah. like it. There's kids out there that are like, I let Boba Fett's my man. And they're going to the parks. They're rising. They're riding Rise of Resistance. They're riding Smuggler's Run. Um, and they're going to grow up and they're going to take their kids. So in terms of like what that ecosystem is, I think it's, I think it's, it's maybe it's silly of Disney to report the numbers in the way they did, but I think it's equally silly to sort of ding them and say star Wars was a bad idea. Yeah. I mean, if you look at this, this is an, uh, Thomas Bacon in the at screen rant wrote a nice counter to this Forbes article that I thought really kind of incisively explored some of the points that Caroline was making. This is something that uh, he brings up here, this graphic here. The number of fiction books uh, that have come out here, uh, original novels, novel adaptations, original junior novels, junior novel adaptations, uh, and young readers' books, because there were no game books. So those all coming out uh, you know, here, and when you look at the number of uh, other stuff that has come out connected to Star Wars, because Disney's purchase of Star Wars reignited people's interest in Star Wars, I think you've got to factor all of that in if you're talking about profitability, right? You can't just focus on the movies or even focus on the Blu-rays and the DVD, all that kind of stuff, the home mark stuff. you got to factor in so many more things. So why isn't that included in the analysis overall of what the profit? I get that you use the 67-page report in the section of it that, you know, the Disney's numbers, and you go after how Disney fudged numbers. I get that. But to offer a more complete analysis, don't you have to look at all of this and try to get numbers for all of this stuff and then offer a more uh, nuanced analysis on whether it has been profitable for Disney or not? And I agree with you. It's way too early in the cycle to see if it's going to be profitable to Disney or not because look at the prequels. No one expected, and at those times, no one expected those films to be reappreciated and to turn a profit now all these years later over the last few years and become these beloved films for certain sections of the fandom in large numbers, so much so that we're getting re-releases that are being celebrated. I'll tell you this right now, in 1999, after that movie came out, there was no one going, boy, I can't wait to see this in 25 years. There was not a lot of people saying that above the age of 10. So this is where the, you look at the situation go, well, you just don't know how something can be profitable, as you were mentioning here, Michael, just a second ago, down the road as, as it builds and as the fandom changes and grows up. Who knows? These sequel trilogies, we may be in our 60s and 70s looking back and people are telling us how great the sequel trilogy was, which will be a hell of a head turner for sure. We just don't know at this point, right? Yeah. Yeah, there was another thing that she wrote on here saying how several of the Star Wars Disney Plus streaming shows were also made in the UK, so their costs are 
are known, but unlike the movies, their profit cannot be calculated. Again, not true. <laughs> <laughs> the Acolyte, parts of The Acolyte were filmed in the UK, and mm -hmm. Andor was filmed in the UK. Three seasons of The Mandalorian, Book of Boba Fett, and Obi-Wan were all filmed in Los Angeles. So again, when, wow. when, yeah. when so much that, when she's writing so much that is, again, demonstrably false yeah yeah i question everything else that comes in the stuff that i'm not as aware of yeah. yeah and i don't want people to misunderstand we're not talking creatively right we're talking financial sense business sense and for disney to be in the business of star wars marvel pixar all these other things that they fox it makes sense because it's going to pay dividends down the road you may be upset about the movies and the quality that's a separate conversation we're talking about would you put, would you have, was it smart to invest in it? And do you anticipate that it will yield this profit for your investors down the road? And this is a long-term game with Disney, Michael. Yeah, I mean, look, in this other article that she wrote that's linked to, yeah. um, it talks about some of the things that happened since Iger came back in. And it's, so since he came back, Iger cut $7.5 billion of costs of content, yes. which was in production, planning on an ESPN streaming service, launched the cut price advertising supported Disney Plus package, offered free water park access to on-site guests in Orlando. And Blackwell's one of the groups that's like challenging them, says they don't think that's enough. And here's like the key to me in all of this, like mm. when you really just take a step back, um, they don't believe that what Iger has done is enough to give Disney a happy ending and suggested breaking Disney up into three separate public companies, which would each have their own specialist management team. And Disney has resisted this, arguing it would spell the end of the synergy and the conglomerate that Walt Disney founded in 1923. And I think at the end of the day, when you want to argue all the different things that you like and don't like about Disney, the idea of splitting Disney up into three different groups who each have different management teams mm. who make their own decisions based only on those things it really does get to the opposite of what creatively I think does make Disney work. Yeah. And I think that's the biggest key here is that what, what Disney is fighting against now is like, oh, let's take this part of Disney, let's take theme parks and just do theme parks. Yeah. No movie, like, you know, let's take, let's take production and production over here. Like, I don't know the specific, the specificity of what they're looking to break up, but it is the more management teams and non-creative people and people who are looking at the bottom line financially that you put in the mix, the yeah. harder it is to do things like Nightmare Before Christmas, Haunted right. Mansion, to do those things. And so I think that what Disney's arguing, and to John's point, despite the fact that Disney has a lot of things they could do a ton better, hmm. what they're arguing on that core level, I think is 100% correct. Yeah. And again, the bigger question in all of this that is being raised is, is Disney doing right by its shareholders? Yeah. And this article is like, well, but look at look at that rise of Skywalker box office. Like, look at that. And you're like, that's not, I mean, the best way I could put this, because I know we're wrapping up, we're running yeah. out of short on time. Think about Disneyland as a park and as an entire park that exists and all the restaurants and places you can get food in Disney. Now, if the pizza port is making a shit ton of money because people love pizza, but the Golden Horseshoe is losing money because nobody's buying chicken nuggets, Hmm. All right, that's fine. <laughs> Disneyland is still doing good. Disneyland's still selling a ton of food. So like, even when you're getting into these articles and you're like, oh, Star Wars is bad. Those shareholders, you're like, yeah, but Marvel had a run that was incredible. Yeah. Pixar is, you know, the past couple Pixar films, questionable, but overall, like Toy Story's doing good. Like Pixar as a brand is doing good. So when you look at the purchases that Iger made, when you look at these big swings, when you look at all of the worlds and the characters that they have brought in, that they can use both in features, on Disney+, Plus, in the parks, in publishing, in consumer products, you know, I think that uh, this is where I'm like, what are you trying to prove with this article? Like, what's really the point? Yeah, and Shannon, it's quizzical that she wraps up uh, the Indiana Jones movie and Willow as a reason for dinging disney and the profitability factor here i don't understand what willow and uh the indiana jones movie have anything to do with star wars i know it's lucas film but the article starts out star wars so if you're going to loop all this stuff in to me it just it well, starts to become a little disingenuous as she was wrapping up the article I mean, like they had nothing to do with this i think well, it's because it is lucas film yeah. it's yeah, because it, it's the purchase of lucas what she's, film, not what, just the what purchase she's of saying star wars. is, is I mean, the focus though i think yeah yeah what she i mean like basically if you if you track her article yeah. and all her article, like it's basically like disney reported it this way yeah that reporting is flawed 
because this purchase has not made money for them. Right. And here is why star Wars, Willow, Indiana Jones, this was this this purchase. They're trying to make this purchase look like it was a good purchase when in fact it was not a good purchase. I mean, that is overall, right. that is the point of her article. Yeah. And I think like, as I said from the top, I just think that the way that she is, again, you want to argue that Disney didn't report it in the way that you think Disney should report it completely valid. But then right. that is applicable to Apple and Warner Brothers and yeah. Google and Netflix. any other company that you can yeah. think of. Um, but overall, taking a giant step back, you go, okay, well, then the real question is, was Lucasfilm a smart purchase or not, even if they've not made all their money back? Right. And again, I think all three of us are pretty clear on that. They're like, mm. that's a good purchase. That makes yeah. sense. Long term, that purchase is going to do right by you. Yeah. And, and Shannon, uh, Oh, any final words on this, Shannon, as we wrap up here? Because we're over the 30 minute mark. We should go. No, I mean, again, it, the, the, she, she used about 5,000 words when she could have used about 500, <laughs> um, in, in my opinion. Okay. If this were a script and, and Vogel was her showrunner, she would have gotten a lot of notes. <laughs> she would have got a lot of notes. I just would have cut everything. <laughs> Well, and, and and I hope, but if if anything else, this article should serve as a bit of a not wake up call necessarily, but just an understanding that for Disney to turn the profit, I think at, what I take away from all of our articles, I did the same thing, Michael. Went back and read our connected articles to this stuff. At the end of the day, Disney is more profitable when the movies are doing well, and so yeah. to find that these next four, it's going to be interesting to see how these next four do because they got to get that mojo working theatrically, as great as it is. Um, to have a streaming service, great as it is to have all these novels and comic books and the parks and all of that stuff, it's super important to get the movies back on track theatrically. And that's where they saw the most amount of profit, it seems like, when they were starting out with Force Awakens, even and with uh, Last Jedi, and then even Rise of Skywalker, to a degree, made a profit. So you look at this, you go, you got to get these things rolling right. So hopefully this is a bit of a a notice that yes, they've got to really put their best people forward. But for I think the hardest right. thing to do and the hardest yeah. thing to remember, and, and this, and they're doing the same thing with Marvel right now. I mean, mm. Iger has not made any uh, secrets of like, let's go back in and get Marvel back on track. So right. Right. the thing to keep in mind, and it's the hardest thing to do when you work in an industry where like everything is about the profitability and the bottom line and building the IP, which is when you go in and have to fix something the way that they do need to fix Marvel and they yeah. do need to fix star Wars. Cause creatively they really do. Uh, making decisions based on fear because you're worried about your investors and you're worried about the bottom yeah, line is yeah. never, ever, ever going to make you make the right creative decisions. You've got to go in and have that freedom to take some big swings, take some risks, take some chances. And everything about this article leans towards a risk averse, play it safe, make yeah. your bottom line back for your investor strategy. Right. And that is at the end of the day, the opposite of a creative, free storytelling first strategy. Yeah. Yeah. Very anti-creative for sure. Um, all right. Well, there you go. That's our breakdown and analysis and conversation over this Forbes article here from Caroline Reed. Uh, talking about whether Star Wars has been profitable for Disney or not, or was a purchase that was worth it or not. So you ho we hope you enjoyed our analysis and our breakdown and Michael's passion. And you see, you know, I'm not the only passionate one on this damn show. So uh, it's great to see that kind of uh, fire from Michael talking about this kind of stuff. So I hope you guys got a lot out of this conversation, got some new points of views to look at this kind of stuff. And we'd love to hear from you all down below. Shannon, what do we have to tell them? Yeah, if you can follow us on social media on Twitter, it's at geek underscore buddies on Instagram at the underscore geek underscore buddies. If you'd like to follow me on social media and get absolutely zero passion on Twitter, it's at Shannon <laughs> underscore McClung on Instagram at Shannon the Geek Buddy. If you'd like to see that barometer rise, you can follow Michael Vogel at MG Tune. And if you want to see the barometer break, you can follow Johnny <laughs> Roca at The Roca Says. Yeah, well, That's I'm going to Disneyland. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly. Clearly. But while I'm at Disneyland, y'all can uh, smash that like button below, subscribe to Johnny's Outlaw Nation page, check out all the amazing content he's got going on down there. Uh, leave your comments. What do you think? Are we totally off the mark? Are we defending Disney when we shouldn't be? Are we right? Are we wrong? Is Star Wars a good purchase or a bad purchase? Is Iger crazy? Let us know your thoughts below. If you're listening to us on the podcast, leave us some stars and some comments so we go up in the rankings. And the best thing you can do is retweet this video, post it on your socials, send it to your friends, and tell them to hang out with your buddies, the Geek Buddies.
Yes. Yeah, I can't reiterate this enough. When you listen to us on the podcast, please patronize the sponsors that sponsor the podcast. Everyone that sponsors the podcast, they're fantastic uh, clients, and we're very blessed to have them sponsoring us and putting ads up on the podcast. So if you listen to it and you hear those ads, please subscribe to those show to the Marquee TV. Please subscribe to Regal Unlimited and the other ads that we've got there. Take a chance on them and tell them the Geek Buddies sent you and use those codes so they keep advertising here on the Geek Buddies. All right, y'all take care of yourselves. Be well, enjoy the rest of your weekend, and we'll talk to you next time with another brand new episode of the Geek Bites or the Geek Buddies here on the Geek Buddies! <gasps> hey!